Welcome to the Trauma Resonance Resilience podcast. And I am very excited today, as I always am, to introduce today's speaker. He's someone who works at the Violence Reduction Unit, although that's not what we're going to be speaking about today. We're actually going to be focusing on uh, maintaining recovery in social isolation. And anyone who's listening who's been in recovery um, or is in early recovery will really value this conversation and will have an understanding about some of the challenges that might be faced. We're going to look at things like trauma, adversity, shame, stigma, seeking relief, uh, why the recovery community works and how it's been adjusted, tools for dealing with fear and anxiety, and we're also going to do a little bit of looking at staying regulated. Please let me introduce to you James Doherty. Hi, Lisa. Hello. How are you doing? I'm great, actually. I'm actually um, I'm in a really good place, to be honest. Just centred, calm. Yeah. There's something about, because I was thinking about this, I was thinking about, it's, it's a bit like, how do you find contentment when all around you is all over the place and that strikes me as the kind of amber nectar of recovery yeah so contentment isn't the absence of the storm it's the calm in the storm so how how do we find the calm in the storm and i guess for people who are in recovery like myself um, that's crucial to maintaining recovery because if you buy into the fear and the anxiety and just just the nature of how the, the fear it's in the culture now, then you run the risk of relapse because the, the default of the person who's in recovery, especially early recovery, is that if they go into emotional disturbance and they spend too long in there, their mind can take them to the place where they always got relief from it. And the tragedy is if they try and apply that solution, which is a short term solution, it creates even bigger problems. But the tragedy for somebody who's navigating an addiction, whether it's to alcohol or substances, that if they buy into that lie, then it can create a, a whole host of other problems, especially when you look at the nature of how you need to satisfy an addiction it means you need to go out into the community and put yourself at risk and we know in the current climate that wouldn't be a good idea yeah i mean what's going on with covid19 brings up so many thoughts for me around people who are in very vulnerable places living on the edge of the cliff mm -hmm. um, and before we kind of get into that i suppose it might be worth talking about how you how how you got to where you got to i mean we have shared stage a few times which is how we met which has been yeah. really lovely um and we have there's lots of things about us that are very different and there's many things about us where we have a meeting place and that we have similarities and one of those is uh, recovery um so how how did you get to this point what 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 are the things that brought you to this point where you're sat in front of me talking about contentment and recovery and regulation? Well, to simplify it would basically be I was sick of being in pain. The drugs and the alcohol weren't working anymore. And I had got to a place in my life where I call it a jumping off point where I was thinking, I'd be better off not being here. So I was almost fixing to make the ultimate sacrifice, which is suicide. But there was also a part of me that resisted that thought. There was a part of me that was saying, that isn't going to be your outcome. There must be a better way than this. You've got a child. You've got everything to live for. And also realising that... that um, I wanted to be a book for my child and also be a, um, an anchor in life, basically, because I'd realised that I, I lacked a lot of 
adult anchors in my own life when I was young, and I knew how disastrous that can be for a young person. So I wasn't want that for my own child. So it was almost as if the thought in my wee arsey was enough to just keep me hanging in there. And I basically took a course of action that led me to a treatment centre. And in that treatment centre, I was diagnosed. So they treated the addiction first. And then once I was detoxed sufficiently, they were looking at what underpinned my addiction. And they identified that um, I had psychological and emotional trauma. And they got me a specialist in to assess me. And she diagnosed me as having CPTSD. But my trauma wasn't just PTSD. It was more complex. It ran deeper because of the environment that I grew up in, the stuff that I had experienced, and also the way I had lived when I was in active addiction, the amount of risk that I put myself in, that I'd never really paused for a moment in my life to reflect the gravity and the impact all that had on my emotional and psychological health. Can we stay with that for a minute? And, and the reason I say that is because I've worked with a lot of... Um, different services across many sectors and and I have worked with drug and alcohol services and one of the things that I've found really difficult about doing that has been that there is a lack of understanding about addiction uh, and alcoholism and whatever in it in all its forms yes. as being a self-medicator uh, I've, I've heard people describe describe it as a choice and the view in society um, also while it separates pharmaceutical drugs from illegal drugs and all of those kind of issues that allow people with addiction to be othered there is something really interesting for me about that lack of connection that is so clear to me uh, and once you heard about it and you had someone in front of you talking to you about it, it was so clear to you, you know, yeah. and I've heard that so many times. And yet there are people even working in that um, field who subscribe to and buy into uh, pathologizing addiction rather than seeing it as a response to deal with emotional pain. Yeah. So... That was part of the reason why I wanted to bring, well, I did bring um, a few other consorting other people, Gabo and Matty, to Scotland. Because his mantra is, it's not why the addiction, it's why the pain. And he says that, um, he said that uh, addiction is about instant gratification despite the long-term consequences. And we need to look at the pain in people's lives. And I've always said that my... My addiction is an attempt at a solution, but it presents as a problem. And because society doesn't understand that problem, they add to the problem with criminalising it and shaming it and stigmatising it. And they unwittingly, because I don't think they deliberately do it, I think because there's a fierce misunderstanding of what causes addiction or what causes an individual to seek relief in substances. It looks as if they're making a choice, but to the individual, it might be the, their attempt at self-preservation. So it's like the best choice they've ever made. And I often think that when I was, so I, I was addicted to cannabis at 11. So I started smoking cannabis young, drinking young. And it became apparent very quickly that I, that I never had control over the amount I took. And then... Um, once I started to understand the science of toxic stress, so if you just look at it under the lens of stress, then because of the stuff I had experienced in life, at 11 years old, I had an overactive stress response. So I was always hypervigilant. I, I always felt ill at ease in my own skin. I always felt as if I didn't fit in. And if you look at cannabis in the simple context that it's a drug, that it's an analgesic, drug in particular, so it'll saturate emotional and psychological pain. So the first time I ever smoked cannabis, it was like 
everything I've been looking for, because it helped me regulate. It helped me feel secure in the world. And my thought, the thought process when, I, when the drug first took effect was that profound for me. I thought that everybody should be smoking it. I thought, <laughs> I thought my mum and dad should smoke it. <laughs> the teachers should smoke it. My children, family, social work should smoke it. Everybody just needed to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> and if, I, if I'm taking a drug that, uh, and, and my thought process is that I need all years to take it to calm down, then I'm basically, that's the, that's the perspective of a, a child who views the world as an angry, hostile, unpredictable, unsafe place. I think you just need to be stoned in order for me to feel secure in it. And I think that's what starts the journey. And there's different views on it, but that's kind of what the research is saying. And it kind of runs parallel to my, my experience and my professional learning on it as well. That, that no wonder people take drugs if that's what they're experiencing. And no wonder they stay on them if society views them as the modern day leper. Because let's be honest, that's the way addicts are viewed in our culture. A view as lepers who chose that life, so therefore they should choose to get out of it. I mean, yeah, it's interesting if we kind of take a moment just to leave that hanging in the air and just kind of imagine a society, and I guess this is sort of Gabor Mate's work, um, imagine a society where we saw um, people suffering from addiction as being in emotional pain. I also think this about prisons when I do anything to do with the prison system. I think why on earth do we not receive people into prison as in need of a therapeutic intervention? Because yeah. you've only got, to, I've never spoken to somebody serving any kind of sentence that doesn't have some sort of trauma in their childhood. And actually the Ministry of Justice research demonstrates and shows that. So there's definitely an investment for somebody to think about certain people in a certain way. Yeah. yeah. So I, if you'd have looked at me when I was in the justice system, I looked as if I had a criminal justice problem. And it looked as if the criminal justice system could have resolved that problem. But if you look at it through the lens of trauma, as we know it, I had a public health problem. And that there was only going to be arrived at any sort of solution if you were applying a public health, the public health tools to it. And that's why I ended up in a hospital for addiction. So I didn't end up in a prison and then all of a sudden that I decided that I had been punished enough when I was going to leave this prison sentence and become a productive contributing member of society. And so I went into a hospital which treated addiction and found out what I suffered from. So I got psychoeducated in the process. And when you get an understanding of what the problem is, or a proper diagnosis and a sufficient explanation, then and it makes sense to you, then you're only ever going to apply solutions to it. And that's why I always say that you'll never punish trauma, traumatise people into a better way of being in the world. Your best efforts exacerbate the pain they're in. And the mere pain you put people in, the mere relief they need to seek. And if they're seeking that relief in substances, then we're unwittingly part of the problem. If we've got a justice system that thinks we can punish, punish traumatised people into a better way of being in the world, it's insane. Yeah, I, I always say that when, I, when I'm working in schools and I speak to people about punishing children who don't who aren't able to yeah. self-regulate is like you know giving somebody the oboe and then punishing them because they can't play the oboe expecting them to then be able to play the oboe because they've been punished for not being able to play it and it's that kind of thing isn't it you know with a with with emotional pain totally so it's also, what's also misunderstood is so the the mind and the body becomes that sickened when you're in addiction. That the addiction specialist will tell you, well, recovery specialist will tell you that the main problem with, with the drug addict or the alcoholic centers in their mind. So it's almost as if a few, if it's about choice, then we're asking people who've become so sickened in mind 
to go into the place um, to find a solution. So it's almost as if what you're looking for, you're looking with. And that's why um, I'm always prepared, even to this day, to go outside myself to seek solutions. So I learned very early that I needed to rely on the elders, so to speak, or somebody who was armed with the facts about recovery. So I wasn't going in here looking for solutions all the time. I was going into people like Lisa, uh, people like Tam, who was my mentor, and running my thought process past them and how I felt. And they gave me simple, practical tools to apply every day that kept me going back to the, the insanity of seeking relief in a substance. Yeah. And that's um, why I'm always, always um, championing mentors and, and psychosocial support for people navigating the justice system because left to their own devices, they don't do too well. And the justice system is brilliant at dealing with that. And yeah. prison just becomes a passive receiver of the wounded. Yeah. I mean, we're in a very, very particular time. And I, I, you know, I would challenge anyone to not be thinking across their life course to date and thinking, you know, in terms of, I mean, I know for myself, I'm thinking this is possibly the best time in my life that this could ever have happened in. Yeah. There are periods across my life course that the thought of this experience would have been terrifying. And there's no doubt in my mind that early recovery and not being able to get to meetings is in one of those places. Really? So now when I got um, sober, which is a very long time ago, um, my first meeting was in 1919. I haven't had a drink since. Wow. Um, we didn't have Zooms and social media. And I mean, basically you were, either, you went to a meeting and then you went to coffee with people from the meeting and then you went to another meeting and then you went to coffee again and you drank coffee until 12 o'clock at night and then went home um, and then got up the next day and went to a breakfast meeting and it kind of just was like that and um, yeah. and I guess all of that's very online now um, so but I you know it would it's not beyond my imagination to think about what kind of challenges people might be experiencing. Uh, yeah. What about people who also on, have not yet made it to early recovery, but we're just about to, I mean, how are people, how are drug users, alcohol users, how are they functioning currently? How are people functioning in early recovery? I mean, you've really got your nose to the ground on that stuff. I mean, what's coming up for you? So <clears throat> what I've, um, what I've seen is the recovery community have just, they have, they have just adjusted to the circumstances. And I think because, because they're just fantastic at finding solutions. They have, they, 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 create, they were the first that I've seen out of any, um, whether it was statutory, third sector, or any other um, process in, in society. The recovery community were the first to set up a format where thousands of people. I was on a recovery meeting yesterday and there were a thousand people on it. Wow. Listening, listening to a speaker from America describing how that there's certain trials and low spots ahead and that that we always find a way to galvanize and find a way to, to socially connect to each other, even though we're physically distant. And the Zoom format's been a fantastic way of doing that. And I've seen all the all the fellowships doing that, or NA, CA, A. So if you're looking for a meeting, you can get on a meeting online. There'll be people sitting um, in meetings online awestruck. So it'll probably bring a whole host of people through the door when this, when we go back to um, when the virus basically goes away and we're, we're able to go back out into the community the way we normally do. I think there'll be an influx of people coming in the door. But the yes, yes, that's a nice side effect because they will have had a taste it anonymously of yeah. what recovery looks like and how to access it and what the people are like and 
all of that stuff like fears about whether you might know someone or you know what kind of stories people tell and the shame and the stigma reduction through listening to other voices of course so that should in face-to-face -face well, time just really support people coming in so some of the things i've seen are like um you're in a meeting a newcomer says i'm i'm new on here uh, this is my first ever meeting and then the next minute you see the chat there's a chat where you can um, speak to people the next minute in the chat everybody's putting their phone numbers in it saying here's my number phone me anytime um, if i'm available for sponsorship if you want um, sponsorship and before you know it it's just organic it's just it's just taking care of business and also the the thing because you know yourself that shame is at the root of all addictions if you've got somebody on this format they don't even need to show their face so they can come in and just they can turn off their, their camera and they can listen and if they listen and they hear people who drink the same as them feel the same as them then it gives them that chance to dismantle the message of shame or disgrace to know that there's no shame in being an addict or an alcoholic the only shame is no finding out what you suffer for and applying the solution to it which is obviously what we've done Lisa or we wouldn't be sitting having this conversation and I, I like you my my life uh, my life will be for here on in about trying to help others my life's meaningless if i'm not helping people and i'm not only meaning that i need to help people to fulfill an unmet need in me i just see it as a sense of duty and there's a joy in it there's nothing better than seeing somebody recreate their life but also knowing that i don't take the credit for it so there's no there's no part in the back or look at James, look what he did. It's nothing to do with me. I just feel as if because of the nature of recovery and how it happens, then it's an honour to be able to pass that on. And if it can make somebody's life better, I also know like yourself that if somebody gets into recover recovery, then the whole has a halo effect on the whole family. So the whole family gets to recover. So it's massive. And of course you know when you're talking about being supportive and helping other people as a an organic thing that supports communities you know i mean this stuff ripples across everything doesn't it totally totally i remember um, listening to a guy and he said that the the 12th step in recovery has been perfectly designed to get me you uh, me out of myself and into you so the more I'm into others, the less I'm into self. So the, the less likelihood I'm going to get caught up in fear, anxiety, trepidation, eh, eh, resentment, dishonesty, selfishness. Because if I'm trying to support the next person, then I'm, who am I less focused on? Me. Yeah. And the less I'm focused on me, the better. It just seems to be. Just seems to be the paradox. Eh? help mothers as you're less focused on yourself absolutely and you know when we think about some of the tools that we get i mean i i definitely felt i mean i was 20 and i definitely felt and that was on the back of homelessness and all you know and care and all of that and i yeah. definitely felt like someone had given me a rule book for living and yeah. the, you know and that is that is very much an aa phrase you know getting the rule book for living and i and i really that really resonated with me because i really felt for the first time that i had some kind of understanding yeah. about how you were supposed to do this when you haven't had quite basic things modeled to you yeah. uh, certainly relational things the way you have friendships the way you have relationships the way you function when you've not really had any of that modelled, and in fact, you've lived in so many different environments, it's been modelled in so many different ways, not necessarily healthily at all, that that leaves you with a, with a kind of fractured sense of self, of community, of rootedness. And I just yeah. all of a sudden felt a deep rootedness to something and that there were things that I could do that would support my growth as a person. Yeah. And yeah. it was beautiful. <laughs> totally. And that's what, that's what I love about um, 
So the, the paradox of the 12 step is they, they tell you, they tell the newcomer coming into the meeting, you're the most important person in the meeting. Now imagine coming into a meeting, you know yourself, you're, the, you're riddled with shame and disgrace. You don't think you're worth anything. And the next minute you've got people telling you you're the most important person in here. Here's some phone numbers, join a group, here's a list of meetings, keep coming back, get a sponsor, people are going to need you. All of a sudden you're put to use right away. But that's just connection, connection, connection. And I think we can learn a lot to what the recovery community do because they're just doing it naturally. It's almost like a compassion assess rather than risk assess. So it's the opposite way, way around for a lot of what we see in the justice system. Things get the risk assess, the life out, everything. And the, the recovery community, compassion assess. And it's that, we need you here, because we don't care what you've done. We do not care what you've done. We only care about what you want to do about your drink and drug problem. And how can we help you? What a message that is for somebody that thinks their life isn't worth living. It's a fantastic message. But I would say as well, and I think it's important to say this, not everybody has had experiences that they felt were positive through 12-step programs. I mean, yeah. I've, I've always very much felt, I mean, I haven't been to a meeting for many years, I have to say. Um, and I'd hit a certain point after about five years and then moved into a therapeutic healing space um, in a different way, which I, I, I guess is quite common. But I've always felt that there are as many ways to get sober or to stop using drugs as there are humans. Um, I, you know, I can only, I only know what worked for me. And actually before I could get into that therapeutic stuff, I had to stop medicating myself. So, and it took me five yeah, yeah. years to, you know, through that program. So my gratitude is phenomenal, but you know, it's, it's different for everybody, isn't it? Yeah, totally. Um, the fellowships haven't got the monopoly on recovery. That's a fact, as you know, there's all different modalities. And, and at one time in my life, I was like, um, early recovery, I was like a 12 step militant. It was like, it needs to be the 12 steps. So that's the only way it'll work for people. And you need to find out what's the matter with them. And, uh, and as I've got wiser and older, and I've come to realize that, um, that there's many ways to recovery, that my only concern is really now, I don't care how you're going about recovery, my only concern is are you in it? Because you're worth more than active addiction, regardless of the addiction, whether it's a behaviour addiction like gambling or um, drugs, as you know. So I don't really attach myself to um, what's the best way and what isn't the best way. It kind of pains me, Lisa, when I see people argue over what's the best way, but it also pains me when I see 12-step recovery, no even get a mention when you look at a lot of the um, current services battling over funding and uh, how, how we should go about treating addiction because we've, we've got the highest rate of drug deaths in Scotland and Europe. Mm. And, and it pains me to see them argue over it because we should, we should all be coming together to find common solutions to a common problem. I don't think there isn't a family in Scotland that doesn't know somebody that hasn't been touched by an addiction of some sort. Mm. Yeah, um, and that's certainly the, the, the research is very clear about that. Um, and I guess, you know, there are all sorts of um, discussions and conversations about why that might be, you know, how has that got to that point? How has that become that way? I mean, what are your thoughts about that? Well, that's another that's another podcast. <laughs> to be <laughs> honest, <laughs> um, there's many reasons why I think this came to that, and as another podcast, we're probably delving into it, and I would just take ages. I'll hold you to that, James. That we'll have another podcast. Um, I mean, and of course, these things are complex. And, you know, I think I was doing, um, I was in conversation yesterday with Ian Thomas, who raised, 
uh, who's also incidentally in in uh, in recovery uh, he's a social worker and um you know he raised the point that around what i sort of talk about political will and he was saying you know isn't it isn't it amazing we have this 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 government that's not had any interest in public services particularly has stripped them to the bone in austerity not been supportive of the nhs but we ha now have a leader who stands outside of downing street clapping the nhs and the whole country is out on the street clap yeah. the nhs but demonstrating political will and the power of political will and in terms of dealing with solutions in a compassionate way we can we can do as much as we can do but we do need that political will don't we totally so if you look at if you look at um how hard i've worked to raise awareness of adverse childhood experiences all i was doing was highlighting a problem but also in the process of highlighting that problem was recognizing that not only is it a problem it's a universal problem so it isn't just a class problem adverse Childhood experiences cuts right across class. And my naivety at the time, when I set out, my naivety was if society identifies a common problem, then they'll start applying the common solutions. Because for me, the adverse childhood experience research is a message of hope rather than despair, because it tells us something can be done. So if you look at AC through the lens of the harm happens in the context of relationship. And if you look at Bruce Perry's research, which this is backed up by research as well, it says that the antidote to adversity is relational wealth. So the message I hope is that we, we as a society in a compassionate response to childhood suffering can pr provide the relationships and create the environments where people can get well and also mitigate, buffer and prevent further harm. So if you look at COVID-19, then we've identified a common problem and look at the political will and applying solutions and how they've used their influence to be able to get a whole country to practice social distancing and uh, galvanise and get a sense of community and a, this shared problem and applying the solutions so that people don't die. But there's a, a there's a there's a missing link in regards to recognising the correlation between stress in childhood and substance misuse, the criminal justice system, health issues like diabetes, uh, cancers, autoimmune disease. And that's missing. So, so it's almost as if I'm thinking, see, after this, I'm going to start speaking about that, about how we could get the political will to come together to combat a virus but we can't get them to come together and combat uh, probably the most toxic virus in the world, you know, which is adverse childhood experiences. It's the biggest public health issue we've got, adverse childhood experiences, but we're all focused on a virus. Hmm. I think that's interesting. That's definitely another podcast for sure. But I think there's definitely something, you know, when we can see exactly what can be done you know big hospitals can be built the whole country can be clapping the nhs yeah. people will cross the road but still smile in a bid to acknowledge that they're keeping social distances people oh, yeah. will stop going out into public all of that happened overnight so yeah. we are people who are very flexible who can change and who can respond to uh, what's going on politically and I think there's a big lesson in there for us all yeah so as we start to come to the end of our lovely conversation I would like to end with thinking about people who perhaps could do with some regulation tools and how we might stay regulated um, when we're in this in this experience of COVID-19 and I guess that's against the backdrop of a lot of fear a lot of anxiety and how that leaks and spills out everywhere how can we how can we manage some of those difficult feelings that might well be very old feelings actually that are being yeah. triggered totally so for me 
the first thing I always do is you, it's acceptance. It's acceptance that I'm not in control of anything other than what's happening in the space of my mind, in the space of the four walls in my house. So on any given day, where I can apply any sense of control I've got over my life is what washing I'm going to do that day. Am I going to do the dishes? Yes or no? Am I going to phone my mum? Am I going to phone my dad? Am I going to phone my, my friends or the people I help in recovery? Am I going to connect with my work? Am I going to change the bed sheets or am I not going to change them? Am I going to take a shower or am I going to take a bath? Am I going to do yoga or meditation? Am I going to go a run when I've got a chance to go out for my hour a day? Or am I just going to go a walk to the park? So it's recognising that whatever's happening um, outside these four walls is absolutely out with my control. And it's recognising what you've got control over. Because anxiety is ultimately about not feeling secure about what's happening in your environment, what you've got control over and what you've not. And, um, and I guess that's a journey to get to that place. But it's also bearing in mind, and one of the biggest tools I usually says is checking in emotionally with other people. So my friend phoned me last week and he says, you're one of my five a day. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he says, I'm phoning five random people a day with my phone. He says, and you're one of them. I'm just checking in me to see how you are. And I thought, that's outstanding. What a way to get out of yourself and into other people is to lift your phone and when's the last time you went through all your phone list and said, right, I'll phone A5 today, you can do it again tomorrow. And what I've learned in that process is that people have got solutions to current dilemmas that I might be living in. So when this type of dialogue happens in conversation, then I leave my mind. Because if I'm caught up in anxiety and fear, I'm ruminating, I'm in my own mind. But if I phone somebody else and start getting out of there, and they gave me some simple practical tools, then I can buy my peace of mind back. How good is that? To be able to buy your peace of mind back and not expect it to arrive in the form of a pill or a bottle or some other dysfunctional behaviour that I used to do that arrives in the form of people. I just need to find the courage to lift the phone. Yeah. And I'd throw in there my favourite, I think, is gratitude. I think it's very, very difficult to be um, anxious or miserable or any of those things if you're in a place of gratitude. So that, that is my go-to. In fact, I don't even need to try to go to gratitude. When I first, when I first learned about doing a gratitude list all those years ago, it was bloody hard work. You know, yeah. <laughs> they say, write th 10 things that you feel grateful for. I'm like... Oh my God, <laughs> 10 <laughs> things. How am I going to write 10 things? And of course, yeah. it's just such, um, uh, it's, it doesn't even require, it's just a presence all the time. Yeah. I have such a deep, deep gratitude for living and the gift yeah. of life. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. It's been so lovely um, talking to you, James, and, um, yeah. and I'm sure we'll talk again. Uh, and it's been really nice that there's been a bit of a theme actually in the last few podcasts where uh, I've been speaking to people who've been in recovery and um, it's just worked out that way um, yeah. uh, and, I, and I th so that's been really good but the main thing is that I wanted to do podcasts that really understood um, I guess the complexity of the time we're in and how we as different humans different organizations different communities different countries are intersecting with that experience yeah so thank you very much james and um i'll i'll uh, i'll see you very soon hopefully thanks lisa